Hold up, I ain't trying to stump, man. But the Yeezys jumped over the jump, man. I be in and out of cleaners like I'm Scotty Pippin. Left my elbow in the pot, I la Vince Carter. Bitch, you weren't with me shooting in the gym. James Harden with the range on me, nigga, way back. Coach, they won't knock me off my pivot. Get it? Been flowing stupid since Vince Carter was on some through the legs arm and a hoop shit. And you can live through anything if magic made it. Ladies and gentlemen, if you don't know, now you do. Yes, sir. We are back. Round of applause for yourselves. Springtime basketball is upon us. This is your guy, Marcellus Ease, and we got a few good things on the docket for today. For starters, Lemon Pepper Lou, a.k.a. Lou Williams, where he gave great insight to a lot of athletes' lives once they leave the NBA. And he touched base on many dynamics playing out from family life to the players going broke. So we'll hear from what the great Lemon Pepper Lou had to say. And we'll also take a look at Anthony Edwards and some of his antics that played out during All-Star Weekend. Edwards, like many other players in his class, guys like Zion Williams, Ja Morant, are they ready to grab the mantle and carry the NBA forward and making sure that the league is progressing to ensure that the next generation is cashing the same quality checks that they are? We'll take a look at some of the dynamics playing out in that situation. And finally, Kevin Durant and his agent Rich Kleiman had did a sit down where they touched base on various topics ranging on his impact in OKC to the GOAT convo, all the way to topics such as Kevin Durant being a leader. This was great insight to the inner workings of the mysterious NBA legend, Kevin Durant. So right now with the landscape being what it is as far as the tech evolving and it's allowing players to have their own mediums, basically becoming their own media networks in a way. It gives us supporters of the NBA and just watchers and lovers of it, a brand new angle coming directly from the players. There's no more middleman. So Lemon Pepper Lou, AKA Lou Williams, had did a sit down in which he spoke about players going broke only after a few years of retirement. Now being financially savvy is not a thing many of us are taught, especially through the school system and even the higher ends of the educational system. Money is really never taught and for a lot of people, because they don't come from a background generational wise that come from money, when someone in the family does tend to get money, they sort of get tricked into paying bills. This tends to happen for a lot of people that become the main breadwinners for their family. They eventually get cornered to being in the position where they're balling out on bills. But Lemon Pepper Lou touched base on this. You guys check it out. And every once in a while, I'll check in. But that's how athletes go broke. A lot of people think it's like you just got a reckless spending habit. Yeah. It ain't that we got reckless Not spending that. habits. We just got crazy overhead. And once the check stop, mm -hmm. it gets completely different. If you if you got forty, fifty thousand dollars in bills a month, right? And but you making half a million dollars every two weeks, that shit is you know. That's right up. Yeah, it's a drop in the bucket. And that half a million, they're not even taking taxes out. <laughs> That's how a lot of players get trapped. That half a million, like forty. So almost 50% of that, depending on what state you're in, already goes to the government. You're supposed to put that aside. Life and the NBA players, what's the average? Four years. Four years. Wow. Four years. Four years is the average lifespan of an mm. NBA career. Mm. And it takes us five years after that to go broke. To go broke. And have to Damn. figure it out, the majority of us. Damn. But it's overhead, bro. It's overhead. It's bad investments. It's yeah. bad management. And that's another way you go broke. Investing into some <laughs> shit you know ain't gonna work. <laughs> that's another. That's another one of our problems. And they say with. the top ones is restaurants, car washes. Yeah, cause, we, cause listen, uh, it, it takes me to be it takes me to be thirty seven and retired to understand <clears throat> that you never invest in anything that you don't know what the fuck is going on. Exactly. It's it's like. Why would you invest in a restaurant? You ain't never waited tables. You don't right. know nothing about nothing. Right. Your management probably has never worked in uh, food and beverage. Nope. It take it takes so much. Like, bro, we invest in so much shit because it sounds good and we Something. fans of it and yeah. we like it. Like I told you, I told you the last time we spoke, I invested in the water company. Yeah. I don't know shit about water. <laughs> I was, I I, I you know, you know what I thought? I'm like, everybody drinks water. This gotta be a great idea. Like. Don't laugh at me, but I'm about to invest in something similar. I'm about to. 
You finna buy you one of them spritzers, ain't you? <laughs> spritzers is popular right now. Everybody getting robbed out of spritzer money. No, it's not spritzers, but I got an opportunity. Yo, Lemon Pepper Lou's giving it up, boy. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not gonna talk about it yet. You should know. talk about it, because I, I so I can make fun of it. Tell you don't do the shit. What is it? Gas station. You go, you you buy or buy. It's not, it's not, it's not 100%. That's the only you reason do, why. You do know we going fully electric, electric. I know that, I know that. And, and it's the thing. They told me, they said, in the next seven years, you're still going to be profitable. Like crazy, still. How? After the seven years, though, he said, shit going to get tight. That's so why I, he said. He let me ask you a question. Go ahead. See, go that's ahead. why we shouldn't invest in shit we don't know nothing don't, about. True. Because you saying, he telling you in seven years, you're still going to be profitable. You're 70% to the mark of extinction. You don't think. That the market is going, everybody going to start saying, well, let me kind of go oh, this yeah, I'm way. Yeah, I'm going to sell. I'm going to sell. No, I'm not. He's not telling me 100%. He's not telling me 50%. What kind of, he uh, said 20%. What kind of, what kind of. Oh, shit. Don't worry about it. We got ghost all All right, we're not doing it. We're not, that's, that's a sign. That's a sign. <laughs> okay. I'm not investing. <laughs> it definitely shouldn't do it. But you know, depending on where you're from, you see all kinds of hustles. And just know on the millionaire level, there's the same type of hustles. They just disguise them different. Maybe the person drives a nicer car or maybe they're wearing a three-piece suit. They got the right Louis Vuitton shoes, but they're running the same game on that level because just over the years of players speaking, it seems like they're always being asked to invest in this, 50 grand on that. There seems to be people running the same type of gas station. Oh, let's start a suit business or t-shirt company. And like Lemon Pepper Lou said, the water hustle. Some of the players, depending on their background, where they come from, they've seen all types of gimmicks. But on the millionaire level, I don't think some of them realize the hustle is the same. It's just that the suit that they're wearing, while they're explaining it to you, is more expensive. What kind of gas station, bro? Gas station with a little mini market. He said you got to do gas station with a mini market because that's how you make extra money with the whole. What's the what's the? It's a brand name or y'all? Brand, it's gonna, a brand name. Gonna I'm not gonna say the brand gas. name, but it's a brand name. Far as the brand name is gonna give us money as well yeah. too because of the brand name. Using the brand name. How much does no. a gas station cost? I gotta go to all my paperwork and all that. See, you shouldn't do this shit. You but, supposed to facts. <laughs> Yo. It's crazy how these guys get into this. They tend to come out, these uh, athletes or celebrities, in almost a group. They'll say like, hey, we got four or five people pooling their money. The person would ask for 20 grand from each person. But at the end of the day, these things never work out. They never tend to work out. I don't know why guys just keep going for this. They act like they're going to put a little 20,000 into something and it's going to generate millions. Never makes sense. Supposed to be able to just no, because my financial advisor is doing all. With so me. that's all right. So that 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 goes to my point. Like, think about I came into the NBA I was seventeen. Right. I you just gotta trust that somebody telling you, yo, True. this is a good idea. True. You know True. what I'm saying? When a lot of times we probably gonna hire a management that's just gonna that's be gonna take care of everything. It's that's gonna true. just gonna be that's your true. local guy that watched you play since right, you was right. a kid. <laughs> He seems like a pretty cool businessman. How much you need? I got you, yeah, bro. <laughs> and, and we man, that's that's a whole economy right there. That is a whole fucking economy. Just taking advantage of what these guys don't know when they're getting their first couple of millions. Put all his money in his hands to invest in shit that we've never ever right. understood or did any research or have any background in, and we throw tons of money like. 250 grand is a ton of money. I don't care it how is. much money no, you No, no, it is. It is. But see, I only had to put that much. You know what I'm saying? He told me, look, I just want you to see how it is. I'll give you 20% so, 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 so. That's what I'm saying. A motherfucker telling you, man, just throw 250 in there. <laughs> For, with a, in a, listen. This call, yo, hey, listen. I don't want to do it. Hey, listen. How much, how much was your S600 you got part? Oh, let me not tell you. Right, come on, man. We don't, oh, bro. It's, it's we don't, bro. We Hypothetically speaking, if you had an S600 outside, how much do you think that S600 is? <laughs> uh, how much I pay for that? It was like 110, uh, I think. We got a confirmation. 110? It was like 110. Would you, would you toss a motherfucker your keys to two of them? Hell no. So... Again, so it's language when these people talk to us about investing. Right. That's true. Two hundred and fifty. Just, just, just throw two fifty in there. Right. Like I done threw so many two fifties at some shit. Right. That's that true. I never got back. You have more two fifties than me, though. You have more two fifties than me. It's because I've thrown a lot of two fifties at shit that didn't work. Right. 
like to this day, I can't, I can't really even hang my hat on a real investment that I can really be proud of. I say that publicly. Wow, that's crazy. This is someone that had over a ten-year career in the NBA, and not one of them, <laughs> not one of those people that approached him, hey, throw some money into this, that he could say he's proud of that shit. I'm telling you once again, that is a whole fucking economy that's around these players. Not only people trying to sell them suits, but people trying to hustle them into investing money into shit that will never, ever bear any fruit. Vending machines. I forgot about vending machines. Vending machines until I realized, oh, I got to stock these motherfuckers. Yeah. No, no. I got to buy this. I got to go to Sam's Club and yeah. make sure. I was getting I was getting them for my son. I said, yo, bro, I'm going to get you like five vending machines. This is what you got to do. I laid everything out to him because I knew somebody from Philly that does not I laid it all out to him. So it looking like, eh, that's too much work. I don't know. Yeah, it's like you the, it's like you bro, the candy you're lady. You're the bro. candy like, lady times 100. Like, I don't want this job. I'm, I'm running around trapping flaming hot Cheetos all day. 35 cents a bag. I don't want this fucking gig, dad. And they tell you, and you got to find places to put them. That's another thing. That's the hardest part. But see, that's, I feel that, like though. it's a Ponzi scheme because you from Philly. I'm from Atlanta. Right. And people are telling us to invest in some of the same bullshit. Same bullshit. See? New hustles, man. Different levels. <laughs> On the millionaire levels, I think the players are finally coming to like, okay, we seen this shit in the streets when we was growing up. But damn, this shit, no matter what level you climb up to, they're running the same game. It's just wearing a different suit. But uh, So uh, the average NBA player plays for four years and then the follow the five years they go broke easy numbers game bro yeah easy numbers game i shit i i do it like this you make five million dollars two and a half of that gone you mm -hmm. got agent fees probably another 50 of that gone mm -hmm. um That's you great. got your dues a lot of people don't know we got dues for dues. the MB, mbpa so yeah, what? you got dudes. So everybody put their money in the pot. So you figure you got 450 NBA players. Mm -hmm. I think the dudes is 15 to 20 grand a year. Everybody wow. put it in the pot. That's how we able to get our health care and all of that type of shit. I didn't know that. And they also got to pay into escrow. Very underrated thing. They got to pay into that escrow in which the owners actually hold. And if the league doesn't hit a certain revenue point or too many teams took losses, the players actually don't get that money back. I believe uh, last year, the, a lot of the players got the money back. I think Stephen Curry even made like $3 million off of that. But yeah, there's escrow tax. There's all kinds of fees these guys got to pay. But once again, in the media, you always see the number that gets advertised is the number before taxes. So off rip, just on the tax portion, before you even get to the agents, all these other extra fees, you got to take 50% off. But Lou's going to break it down right here. He's going to let you know how much does a payer truly pay out in order to make one million. Yeah, you got dues, then you got uh, you got your personal staff. Right. So I'm talking Everybody about just has. the staff yeah. of financial financial yeah. advisor is probably 1%. Mm -hmm. Agent at a high number is gonna get 4%. Right. Or, but you can negotiate from one to four. Okay. So before you look up, you probably at 1.5 million off of five God. with nothing. Dang. And these benzes that we keep talking about in these <laughs> mansions and shit. <laughs> These girlfriends and these Chanel bags, mm. before you know it, you you not a millionaire no more. Right. You a high thousandaire on paper. You can tell a motherfucker, fuck you, I'm a millionaire. Right. In real life, a lot of that pie gone. God. A lot of that pie is gone, and they tricked you into just being, <laughs> into just fucking paying bills. That's the trick. They have you just sitting there paying bills. You paying insurance on cars you don't even drive. You paying a house. I got to get maintenance on it, landscaping, all kinds of shit. You end up just being a baller on paying bills. Yeah, so you got to, so again, and we 17, 18 year old kids, these are our first experiences. Mm -hmm. It's going to take us, I don't care what you go to school for, it's going to take you five, six years of that experience yeah, to even realize what's happening to you. Right. Facts. Facts. It's, it takes most regular adults in regular jobs to hit their 30s and 40s to understand financially what they're supposed to be doing. Like, can you imagine an NBA player getting millions of dollars as a teenager? Once again, that's a whole fucking economy in itself. 
just trying to hustle them out of their money. You know what I'm saying? Like I was, I was, hey, listen, man, I had a, I had a week. I had a week. I bought a Ferrari and a Lamborghini in the same week. And I, I rationalized it with my financial advisor. And he was like, I can't legally tell you what to do with your money, but I don't think that's a good decision. Right. And I said, it's cool. I make a bunch of this shit. <laughs> that's what you told him. I did. I did. I, but <laughs> Once again, Lemon Pepper Lou giving it up, boy. Damn. He just fucked off his money. Oh, my God. That's crazy. In a week. Those two cars in a week. And as soon as he drove it off the lot, just the value he lost on those two cars alone is it's insane. And you know on those checks, he didn't even pay taxes on it yet. Once again, the players are responsible for holding off their portion that they're supposed to pay the taxes. The league does not do that for them. And when you really think about it, it's kind of a double finesse. Like the league has them sign these million dollar contracts, but they pay them weekly. So the league is actually building up interest on that money that they owe the players. They got all the NBA salaries lumped in a pot and they're having these guys sign five, six, seven year deals while at the same time they give them their money week by week and they're collecting interest on it. So there's money being made on top of the player's salary that's given out. And this is for the league as a whole. But I was young. What year was this? What year? You remember? Man, I had to be 24. I had to be 24, 25 years old. So it was old. like the six or seven season? Yeah, see? Damn. Remember when I told you I don't remember a goddamn thing? Yeah, with people yeah, around yeah. me. So 2012. That's that's considered the fourth wall right there. Remember we were talking earlier? Yeah, yeah. Like, it was the, the fourth, fourth wall. wall. Yeah, that's the fourth wall with paying him. Paying this motherfucker <laughs> too. <laughs> <laughs> but no, like you have, you have. You want to enjoy some of this stuff too, yeah, bro. You do. Like you, do. you want you to do. enjoy it, and so it's nobody sitting there giving you real numbers because it's coming in so fast. Money coming in so fast. That's just a contract. Like you might have a shoe deal, you might have some endorsements. So mm -hmm. you feel like this shit is gonna be forever. It was right. culture shock to me. The first week I didn't get a big check from being retired, mm. where it was like, oh, oh I gotta figure this shit out. Yeah, what? like life has begun. <laughs> Like I feel like my life really started when I re when I retired, bro. Wow. Because I never spent that much time at home. Never, never read. Listen, all my mail. My mom has a habit of coming to my house with a shoebox, taking all my mail, right. taking it to her house, coming back the next day. Like, boy, you, you got shit to pay. <laughs> you don't look at your mail. I'm like, how I'm gonna look at my mail? You come get you it. Right. You've been doing this for 20 years. Right. You know what I'm saying? So that was my first time of really introducing myself to my real life and once again on that million dollar level a lot of these guys get tricked in to just becoming ballers of just paying bills yeah like i had never spent weeks at a time in my own crib so is that is that another reason where they say a lot a lot of when athletes retire they get a divorce too because now they home yeah, yeah. so much yeah and yeah and that home dynamic is definitely going to be different because the players can no longer hide behind a lot of those large checks, just giving the girls out money and just not being around. They really interact with their family in spurts. You don't really know the woman you married. Mm. You ain't, like, I'm from Atlanta. Right. If I'm playing for the Clippers, she might move with me, mm. but I'm on the road three, four nights a week. I only got to deal with her for two nights, at, two a nights time. at a time. And that's another mistake players do. Depending on where they get traded to, they end up buying a house in that city, not realizing, hey, <laughs> The league has services set up to get players rentals. It doesn't make sense for them in every city that they go to to buy a mansion. I never, ever understand that. Because at the end of the day, most of these guys, they live out in L.A. Most of them. You dig what I'm saying? I got to deal with it two nights at a time during the week. You know how we keep her happy? Keep sending her to the mall. To the mall. Right. That's how you keep her quiet. That's why, that's why it can, it's okay. It's okay, I understand, it's a sacrifice. Mm -hmm. I'll stay home with the kids. Right. <laughs> it's okay, you know why? Cause she can shop in That's peace, right. you ain't in her fucking yeah, ear, face. and mm. you on the road doing whatever you doing, she ain't in your ear, mm. come home two days out that week, play family, and then you retire, and you gotta deal with this shit 24 oh, seven. Oh, oh. And you like, hold on lady. You not gonna roll over, play family, not gonna roll over, play family like that. Nah. <laughs> Yo, Lou really giving it up. He, he ain't lying, though. He ain't lying. They got to play family all of a sudden. They got to play citizen and play family. That is a culture shock to a lot of players. I seen Dwayne Wade say he need therapy after retirement. 
We see Melo going through it. A lot of these guys go through it when they first retire because their whole identity has always been surrounded as being that basketball player. And now they don't have their regular routine. It's just things change. A lot of dynamics change. And sometimes their woman don't even look at them the same when they see that they have to dramatically reduce their lifestyle. Even though their lifestyle is still very high end compared to most regular citizens. But the fact that you have to downgrade, you know, a woman never takes that lightly. And we even seen the great Kobe Bean Bryant kind of go through the same thing. He started making a reappearance almost a few months before he passed away. He came right back into the fold because he had to develop a brand new relationship with basketball. He became sort of the wizard, the old man wizard with the Mamba Academy. And now he's teaching players same way he was teaching his daughter. He took on that new wizard character of basketball. You want to come to me for information on the game on how to analyze the game, how to understand the game. So guys' relationship with the NBA definitely changed in retirement, and it also changes in that home life. Oh, this is real shit. Is real I said it. <laughs> I said it. I said it. Play family. Play Damn, Play house. Tough, yeah, you playing tough. house. You on, your, you on your best behavior because the moment that you walk out of that door, mm -hmm. A lot of my good brothers are who they say they are. Real yeah. God-fearing family yeah. men, and some of us like to play. You know what I'm saying? Some of us like me included. I take, I say I'm first. So anybody saying I'm talking too much about it, right. I was one of them. I was one of them. I was there a team captain. Damn. How about that? You know what I'm saying? But And that's another aspect. That lifestyle, that NBA lifestyle, the cars, the women. Some players that had longevity in the league, they get accustomed to certain things. And like how Lemon Pepper Lou said, quote unquote, play family. You got to play the family man role. You got to ignore some of them hoes that are calling you out to come to Vegas, to come to Miami, to come to the boat parties. <laughs> Those calls now, they can't get answered quite as quick because you're at home now. You're not on the road where your woman ain't checking your phone. She ain't really checking what you're doing. The lifestyle adjustment is definitely a culture shock. That's the reality. So when you get when you get to a place where, like I said, I, I was single, so I'm coming home with just my crib. Yeah. But at imagine, one point you weren't single though. You had no. I had I had yeah, two different two yeah. separate cracks at having yeah. a family. Yeah. It yeah. just it just didn't work out. But right. yeah, now they're coming home. The children are crying. All kinds of shit going on around them. They got to hear the woman nagging. It's just <laughs> a lot of these guys, man. They have two deaths. They have their real death whenever it comes, but they have their athletic death. The time when they have to retire from the league and actually pivot away from that NBA lifestyle. It's definitely a culture shock. You come home and you got you got that scenario where you got a wife and mm -hmm. let's say you don't even have kids involved. Or you got a long time girlfriend. Y'all y'all really got to get to know each other for real. Because mm. he's used to spending time with you. Then dip it. Getting the fuck out of here. Right. Spending time with you getting the fuck out of here so how you gonna keep her happy when yo yo keep her yo keep her happy button is send her to the mall right damn Woo. lemon pepper lou giving it up boy i always wonder why certain players get married to women that they randomly meet when they're in the league they just met them for a summer had a good time and now that's their wife most of these guys if they didn't come into the league with a woman that they already knew from a young age when they didn't have anything they kind of got to go to Derek Jeter route. They could have their fun while they're in the league, but marry that woman when you're around her 24 seven and you don't have to fly to a hundred different places in a season. They actually get a better understanding if this woman fits into their life. But that's why we sometimes see the divorce rate so high for these guys outside of retirement, because those days are you just throwing a bag at her when you do some dumb shit and you just send her shopping. Those days are over. Once again, you got to cut your lifestyle. You're not getting those million dollar checks again. So those little band-aids you throw at your woman, it's no longer working. And when your kids start getting on your nerves, you don't have to kind of push it to the side because you're about to fly out to an away game. You actually got to be there. A lot of these guys don't even understand their kids in full because they only really had the opportunity to be there with their children in spurts. And that half a million dollar check that you got last week, that ain't a half a million dollar them. check this week. So this week you got to tell her, I could still send you to the mall, but like 
Oh, well, let me see. <laughs> yeah, let me see because <laughs> our overhead is already high at that point. You see, by the time the players have to start cutting down their lifestyle, what's not going to be cut down is their overhead. You still have those three cribs that you own across the country. There's got to be maintenance on those homes, housekeepers, landscapers. You got all these luxury cars. You're not even driving, but you're paying high ass insurance on. You still probably have agent fees that you still owe or taxes you haven't paid because maybe when you first got into the league, you didn't know that you were supposed to save half of your check or even worse. Sometimes these players get to borrow money from the bank. These are special kind of loans that celebrities and multimillionaire, I would say entertainers on that level, they actually get different types of loans from the bank. Let's say if X player gets a five year contract for $120 million, the bank will actually qualify him for a loan to get that money up front. And he can guarantee that loan with the signing of his NBA contract. So a lot of players sometimes that are blowing through money, they get actually set up in these circumstances. And a lot of your favorite celebrities, they take out these type of loans, especially if they know they have five or six movies coming down the line. And hopefully one person that didn't get caught up in that mess was Jonathan Majors, as he had a ton of movie gigs lined up. And the banks will quickly, quickly run at someone like him to give him a lot of that money that he'll earn in the future up front, as long as they get small little interest payments on the end. Once again, most average citizens are used to either credit cards or small personal loans. But when you start getting on that million dollar entertainment level or just you have more assets to kind of leverage towards getting loans, the banks kind of give you different type of paperwork. And a lot of these guys get caught up in it. So hopefully for Jonathan Majors, he didn't sign any of those type of deals and get a lot of money up front. Because before he got canceled, my man had money scheduled out the ass. <laughs> Let me see what else I got on the on the forecast before right, we right. we spend the money on that. And that's when a, a lot of those dynamics, what you what you're used to and the life that y'all have been accustomed to having for years at a time. Right. Like this is you talk about a career worth of time, bro. If you're a 10 year vet and let's add the kids in. Bring the kids into the scenario. Now the kids getting older. You don't want them to move every time you move. You might be at the tail end of your career where you're going to have a bunch of stops. Right. That's just how it go at the end of your career. Your right. ass just starts sliding all over the place. You know what I'm saying? Now you got a, a nine-year-old. You don't want that nine-year-old to not have a consistent home, consistent friends, yeah. build a, a sense of community, sense of community build a sense of herself, you know, be able to grow in and become herself. So now you say, well, wifey, you stay at home. Mm -hmm. You stay where you are with the, with the baby or with the babies or whatever. I'm going to go out on the road. So now you're spending months at a time without your, your family. So when you come home, man, y'all don't know who y'all are for longer than Who five. that little nigga? Yeah, for real. <laughs> straight up. Because you know what it is? You get into your room, you check in, do your check-in phone call, right. go back to living your life. Oh, she go back to managing the house. So mm. you know your wife for five minutes at a time, for real. So hell yeah, she leaving your ass when that shit, when when right. the shit that keep a smile on right. her face right. ain't ain't there no more. That that resource ain't there no more, and it right. get different. So there you have it. That money can't be a mask anymore. <laughs> but Lemon Pepper Lou definitely gave it up. Definitely put things into proper perspective on some of the dynamics that play out within players and their personal lives, as well as on the court. Just some of the dynamics financially that plays out within the organizations, but. Once that money runs out, the life that they lived, I mean, NBA player could have a baby while he's in the league. And then by the time he gets out, that baby's like 10, 11 years old. All that time missed. There are consequences for that. And that money at first was a mask for it. But what happens when the mask is gone? So great to hear this perspective from Lou Wool. Like I said, this is a very unique time and space where we can hear directly from the players, no more middlemen, and guys could definitely get their shit off. So as the landscape of the NBA continues to change, we're hearing rumblings of who's going to be the next generational star to actually take over and be the face of the league. As guys like LeBron James continue to go up there in age, but just like the players before him, they made sure that the game was in a proper place for the future players to come in and continue to enjoy the spoils of all the revenue that's coming into the league. Now, when it comes to today's younger players, not only some of them are not ready to grab the mantle, 
but they're also not bearing the responsibility to make sure that the league financially is in a good position to make sure that the next generation comes in and continues to enjoy the same spoils. And this leads me up to Anthony Edwards and some of the gimmicks that he was pulling out in this past weekend's All-Star game. Just in a way, he was kind of making a mockery of the game and not understanding the fact that Adam Silver and the NBA are trying to position that All-Star weekend as a nice piece of inventory for streaming services to come in and start bidding on. It's more money for the league, thus more money for you and more money for the future players coming in. And make no mistake about it, the money is not guaranteed because the CEO of Turner slash Warner Brothers, David Zasloff, had made a comment last year that they're going to be very conservative when approaching the NBA on renegotiations. And they actually, quote unquote, don't really need the NBA. So these type of comments coming out during an investor meeting means that the league still has to be in a good position where they're putting out a good product to get other bidders and other suitors to make sure the money keeps climbing up. But I'm not sure if Adam Silver is not prepping the younger stars of the NBA to make sure that they're carrying the mantle of the league and putting out a good product on the floor. As Anthony Edwards made quite a few comments this All-Star weekend, beginning at one of the practices. Um, that's a good, great question. Um, I think for me, it's an All-Star game, so I don't think it, it, I will ever look at it like being super competitive. It's always fun. Um, but I don't know what they can do to make it more competitive. I don't know. I think everyone looks at it. It's, it's like a, it's a break. So I don't think nobody want to come here and compete. <laughs> Edwards got to have a better poker face than that. Of course, everybody knows you guys don't want to compete. But still, man, you got to be political about these type of situations. Because that five-year extension you got for $260 million did not necessarily come from the fans. That's the corporate sponsors that allow you to cash those large checks. But his antics just didn't quite stop there. He also did another interview during a Saturday practice, and he seemed clueless about just the overall weekend and even the order of events. What you looking forward to? What event? Saturday night. Saturday night? What event? I don't even know the events. Um, Skills, duck, that's three tonight. point. That's tonight. That's tonight, right? That's tonight. Oh, yeah, tomorrow. I'm tripping. Yeah, where you at, man? Yeah, I'm tripping. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to Cat being in a three-point contest, 100%. Oh, yeah. For sure, yeah. for sure. And lastly, what is your goal in the All-Star game? Like, what are you trying to do? I'm going to shoot our left hand the whole game. i seen you doing that in warm yeah. right now. I'm going to shoot a left hand the entire game. That's going to mess up your field goal percentage, though. It's an All-Star game. Ain't no field goal percentage. <laughs> Ant, do your thing, brother. Thank you for joining me, man. <laughs> I don't know if Ant-Man was getting lit during the whole weekend, but damn, that shit was bad. He just did not give a fuck. But we got to understand, Silver was really desperate to try to leverage this all-star game as a piece of inventory during the television negotiations, the same way the NFL leveraged their wild card weekend. The NFL got $100 million off of a wild card weekend. That's not even a real important part of the playoffs. The NBA is in a prime position to do the same, but the players are dropping the bag. Look at Adam Silver's stress during his annual All-Star Game presser about making sure that the players understood there has to be a level of competitiveness in this All-Star Game. And I think we sat down with the players and we listened to them. We said, all right, we have to return to um, basketball, back to basketball, so to speak. It's about the game. And that's ultimately how we're going to be judged. I think sometimes when you're in the market, for an all-star game and you're having fun at all the events and the parties and all, the, all those other things, people often are saying to me, I've been doing this a lot of years, before the game even takes place on Sunday night, it's been a fantastic all-star weekend. And then of course, if the game is lousy, then you all just doing your jobs and representing what's happening here to the world, the reports are it was a lousy all-star because the game wasn't that exciting. And frankly, fans are able to vote by what they watch too. They have so many options. So the thought was here, we sat down with the players. We said, let's return um, to a focus on the game of basketball. Let's come pretty close to your typical routine. We still want the opportunity to introduce to fans around the world the all-star rosters. We still want to have a little bit of fun at halftime. But so just add a slight amount of time. And let's see what we, what we get. My, my sense is it's a combination of discussions that um, 
the leadership of the players are having with, with the All-Stars. I think discussions Joe Dumars is having directly with players, frankly, having Joe Dumars and his credibility in the league office. I think we're going to see a good game tomorrow night. So right there, we're seeing the reason why Adam Silver has switched the format. He spoke to the players. He spoke to other leaders like Joe Dumars about the level of competition and getting some sort of product out there that they could pitch while they're in TV negotiations. So you saw that at the very end, he said he was expecting at least somewhat of a level of competition. He got guys back to the same regular routines. They don't have to stand and wait for 20, 30 minute intros. The halftime doesn't have to be as long, but yet the players still didn't give a fuck. There's a lack of understanding. There was a money play here, a major money play. The league, think about it. The league could have got enough money for certain segments of this all-star weekend whether it be the friday night saturday night or parts of sunday they could have got something just only available in one of these tech companies that are trying to grow their audience they don't mind even grabbing the celebrity game as long as it's advertised let's say solely on netflix that's for netflix to gain a subscriber base an audience that they never had access to so right now it's looking like the league kind of blew this position and you could see it play out no further than Adam Silver's reaction when announcing the winners of the All-Star game. You could hear it in the sound of his voice, just a disappointment. And to the Eastern Conference All-Stars, you scored the most points. Well, congratulations. Silver did not even announce a winner. He just said you guys scored the most points. And if we take a step back and look at some of the star players, that are in this game, around the time they came into the league, the cap had went up in 2017. So the money was already a lot bigger once they got to the league. And now the cap is about to go up again. And the same guys who benefited in 2017 are now in their prime and they're about to benefit again from the cap going up. So in a way, it might be a naive assumption that the money's always going to be up. A lot of the players right now are kind of suffering from the rich man's disease. And you see it play out no further than the younger stars of the league like Edwards, Zion Williams, Ja Morant continue to fumble the bag as being a face, being an image of the league. But if you really look into it even further, maybe the players of the early 2000s or mid 2010s, maybe they were the last breed of players who actually understood that they were supposed to carry the game forward so the next generation can grab the baton and make shit even better. Just the level of competitiveness they had, the strive for perfection, even going back to Kobe Bryant, the money wasn't as good in the league. It just started going up, but it was nowhere near the levels that it was at in the 2010s. It took the overall media landscape to change for the NBA to get a large bulk of money. And this is everything after Michael Jordan, Larry Bird, Magic Johnson. The NBA really didn't start getting large TV money until they got on ESPN in the mid or early 2000s. But Kobe was definitely the last dying breed of players who understood you wanted to match up and play against the best. I think the All-Star game in general needs a little revamping because it used to be competitive. Yeah. It used to be competitive and like you know, fans want to see the best pickup game in the world. Yeah. That's what this is. They don't yeah. want to see you running up and down and dunking and doing all this crazy like... They want to see the what happens when you get these collection of best basketball players on the planet and they play and they go head up against each other. Man. Yeah. I mean, you guys play harder at a pickup game in UCLA. For real. Yeah, and ain't do. billions of people watching. For real. Definitely do. You know what I'm saying? Definitely do. They uh, got turned the All-Star game needs a little needs a little changing. Um, I always love competing in them. Um, I didn't lose many of them. Nah, me and CP one, used to nah, talk all the time. Like, on. You took it serious. Yeah, we, yeah. we went. Like, I don't think me and CP, when we played together in the All-Star game, I don't think we've ever lost a game. Yeah. And we okay. used to look at each other and say, okay. Oh, serious. They go. don't want to play, we gonna yeah, play. Yeah, fourth quarter, let's yeah. go get them. Yeah, just thinking back, <laughs> that all-star game where Kobe Bryant locked up LeBron, that's probably the last time we've seen real competitiveness in that fourth quarter, Jesus. But the influx of money the league is getting right now is not a guarantee. So just having players missing from the dunk contest, the skills challenge actually being the brightest point of all-star weekend, it shows you the sad state of things. But it's tough to see where the league goes from here because right now they're suffering from the rich man's disease. We're at a point right now where we got three to four year players signing for 260 million. 
But just as the media landscape was rising in the early 2000s, thus creating an influx of money into the NBA, right now the media landscape is actually declining and a lot of the league's partners are actually consolidating at this very moment. TNT, ESPN, Fox, and Warner Brothers all collaborating on an app, while at the same time ESPN plans on launching their own direct-to-consumer service in 2025, and the NBA in the other end is losing a lot of money through their local TV deals, as one of their major partners, Diamond Sports, have filed for bankruptcy. So, once again, the money is never guaranteed. Soon to be Hall of Famer Kevin Durant had did a sit down with his good friend slash agent Rich Kleiman in which they spoke about a bevy of topics ranging from his impact in OKC to where he falls in the GOAT conversation. And in this current media landscape it's great to see Kevin Durant having a medium in which he could express his thoughts and opinions on what's going on around the league as he is one of the most misunderstood players of this era. And if you look back across the annals of NBA time there's been many greats similar to Kevin Durant that have been misunderstood, like Lakers legend Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. But you guys check it out, and every once in a while, I'll check in. You're a Phoenix son, but you were in Oklahoma City for nine years, and it now is starting to really, like, dawn on me when I see how good they are now. How do you feel when you see them, like, back to being, like, a team? Like, does it make you think of you guys at all? No, I mean, I knew that the leadership there was smart enough to figure out uh, how to continue to build the brand for one and then build the team. You know, I, you know, when you have your first entry into the NBA is Sam Presti, you got great players like Russ, James, myself, Serge Ibaka, you got veterans like Perk. You know, and as a young GM, Sam was like 30 when he was a GM. I didn't realize that. I mean, when I got 30 and I started, I was 19 at the time, but he was 30 years old as a GM in the NBA. That's insane. So. He was going through, we all were going through this maturation process and just figuring out what it is to be in the NBA and in, in these positions. Damn, Sam Presti was 30. He must be a wizard by now. <laughs> like he's putting on a clinic, a fucking masterclass on how to rebuild an organization. After losing three stars, they pretty much drafted back to back to back MVPs. I've never seen this before. And I, and I kind of knew how smart Sam was that he'll figure it out. You know what I'm saying? And But the, the craziest part is like seeing the city itself. Because when I first got there, it was like one skyscraper building, not many hotels. It wasn't much going on downtown. It was it was just a raw city that hasn't been exposed to like, it feel like it was exposed to the rest of the country. And now you go there, they, got, they have resort hotels, they got you know, multiple uh, skyscraper buildings, uh, you know, and building towards uh, eventually having an all-star game there, which does so much for a city, you know what I'm saying? So I look at my time at OKC from that perspective uh, because we help build a city up more so than just build a fan base for basketball. I felt like we built up the core and the culture of what this town is going to be about, you know? And OKC should definitely show much love to Kevin Durant. There was a year in which a tornado devastated down there and Kevin Durant donated millions of dollars to get people back on their feet. And all of that stuff comes t together and I realized what it's like not having a team in your market as opposed to having one, you know? So for us to be expansion and do what we're doing now and to see where they are now, I feel a part of it. Mm -hmm. uh, Sam Presti took me in, your whole coaching staff. and. I swear to you, as a New York sports fan, and New York sports fans are the best. I always stand behind New York, obviously. But I had never seen, like, a connection like fans and players had. Like, I had seen in Oklahoma City where when I walked in, the people at the, like, concession or the people that were taking your ticket felt like they were your family, right? Yeah. But I feel like the thing was, you did grow up with that city, and that city grew up with you, and it felt like a family loss, and it was bigger than basketball. And the Warriors part of it was just like, all right, that's that'll add to the fire, but yeah. it was really that this family had to separate. Yeah, and, and and I understood that, and I didn't underestimate people's feelings about me not being a part of that family anymore. I took that in, and David thought and understood what it meant and gave people their space and time to process it how they processed it and then we'll have a conversation later. But but at the end of the day, Kevin Durant had to do what was best for him. 
at the time just creating a winning formula with Russell Westbrook as his wingman, it just reached its peak. And as simple as that. Because now even looking back, no one has nowhere near the playoff success with Russell Westbrook as their wingman than KD. And this is after Westbrook has been with LeBron James, James Harden, Carmelo Anthony, and with Paul George. I respected how real those feelings were and how real that family we built were. And, and I think regardless of me having that jersey on, it's going to still feel that way because yeah. OKC now has done, what, how many years now? 15, 16 years of his existence. They really are into the alumni now. And I can feel that when I go back. I can feel that talking to my former teammates. And that makes me feel proud because, like, we really started that organization off. And that just goes, that's a testament to everybody there because they built that family. We all did, but it was it was encouraged every day that, like, yo, this is this is who we is. This is who we are when we come to Oklahoma City. Only sports, major sports town, uh, sports franchise in the city. Everybody's rallying around us in the whole state. Hell yeah, they had to ingratiate themselves very carefully in Oklahoma City. They had KD walking around with that Bible. I'm not sure if you guys forgot about that, but he definitely was walking around with that Bible. And it makes sense. You know, you want to relate to the people that's there, but things have definitely advanced since then. And hopefully in the future, they're able to host the All-Star game in that city. Felt that way. And you know what? It's going to age really well. I think so, too. And even though it was rough for me, with the fan base and some of the people that worked in the organization for a year or two. It was rough, but when I started to reflect on it, it was just like, it was special what we did, regardless of the championships or not. I think that building the culture there so fast like we did, and... Woo! <laughs> that statement right there came and do any justice. Them boys came up so quick. Just that San Antonio Spurs team of 2012... They were so good during the regular season. And Durant and Westbrook came out of nowhere and just dusted them out the playoffs. That's something that's really never talked about. And also the fact that they pushed the Warriors to the brink where it took an all-time performance from Klay Thompson just knocking down all those threes to actually get the Warriors out of that series. It's an untold chapter in the Kevin Durant story building a, a core fan base, not just in Oklahoma, around the world. I see people who still Thunder fans from those days. That meant a lot. You know, winning championships and being at the highest level, I gained a lot of perspective on, like, what am I truly doing this for? Because when you reach the mountaintop and all we covered is an NBA championship, and when you finally get there, you start to realize, like, this is not it. It's like, it's not the only thing you want to do. It's like, you want to continue to keep going after that. Then you do it for a second time. It's just like, damn, have I accomplished everything? What's really pushing me to continue to wake up every day and do this? And it, and it went back down to just like, I truly just love the crowd. And that's what's keeping me up every day, regardless of what happens around that and the results from that. I just enjoy the craft. And that's something that's... Um, that I've learned from winning and losing and just being in the league over time that it's simply about perfecting what I'm doing every day. I feel like that's why it's so hard for people to believe that when you talk about the GOAT conversation, for instance, right, that yeah. you're talking about it in that sense. And I think it's hard for people to believe it at all. It's like, I actually think that people don't think you know that everyone has an asterisk next yeah. to your championships. Yeah. And I almost say that stuff to... Now, when it comes to Kevin Durant, the same people that have that asterisk for his championships in 2017 and 2018, they have to have the same energy for the championships LeBron has in 2012 and 2013 down in Miami. There's no way, pound for pound, you could convince anyone that the talents of Dwayne Wade and Chris Bosh is not better than having the wingman talents of Klay Thompson and Draymond Green. There's just no way. You could even add Andre Iguodala to that mix. Those three versus those two alone, it's not even close. Dwayne Wade is top three shooting guards of all time. Like LeBron has played with some major talent throughout his career. Challenge people thinking on why do you even put, why do you even have a GOAT list for one? And what does it actually mean in the grand scheme of things? 
That's right. That you're talking about it in that sense. And I think it's hard for people to believe it at all. It's like, I actually think that people don't think you know that everyone has an asterisk next yeah. to your championships. And we also have to and we also have to put into proper context that the Warriors really drafted all their guys. And their only real acquisitions to the team was Kevin Durant and Andre Iguodala. So it's not like they went out and purchased a super team. They really drafted most of their key players. Got one guy, I believe through trade or through free agency, I believe it was a trade, developed their second round pick in Draymond Green and went after Kevin Durant. That is a very different thing than some of the super teams we've seen formulated today, where you have multiple star players who are transplanted. I don't think you know that everyone has an asterisk next yeah. to your championships. Yeah. And I almost say that stuff to challenge people's thinking on why do you even put, why do you even have a GOAT list for one? And what does it actually mean in the grand scheme of things? And to also highlight that it's such a, subject, uh, such a subjective thing that I can ask 20 people that you may not ever know or talk to who they go and they may say me. They may say Tracy McGrady or Paul George, but. And also the nuances of the game. What are the rules? <laughs> the league, every 10 years, they change the rules. I'm not saying necessarily the fundamentals of the game, but they do add certain nuances you know, the kind of play calling, not allowing the defenders to touch guys a certain way, a certain way centers have to elevate in the paint. Offensive players today can actually push off with their off arm. The hooking that we've seen James Harden effectively utilize in the mid 2010s, every decade has its nuances. So you really can't compare. What does it matter? Like at the end of the day, what truly matters in this thing? You know what I'm saying? And so like, yeah, I've, I've heard people come up to me and passionately tell me I'm the greatest they ever seen. And I feel like I've accomplished things on the court and been in situations that the greatest have seen. So I feel like I can have a conversation about basketball with a Michael Jordan or Kobe Bryant or LeBron James, not about bragging about how much we've done, but like, what did you see out there? And did I see the same things? I feel like I can have those conversations with the greatest to ever play. And they would feel comfortable knowing that I understand where they coming from and their perspective on the game of basketball because I'm well-traveled and I'm truly a student of the game on top of me experiencing the same things they did. So when I say this GOAT thing, it's more so like, can I have a real basketball conversations with some of the best that's ever played basketball or walk those sidelines? <laughs> KD speaking facts right here. A lot of that GOAT conversation is really circle talk. It slowly has become the same way the political theater today plays out. It's just endless banter back and forth and guys picking sides. And you see this play out no further than a lot of the major sports media outlets of today. They got analysts completely taking sides with players to the point where they're supposed to be reporting what's going on in the league. But instead, they're really reporting things no different than Fox News would or CNN would. Just like those networks are aligned to certain parties, you see some analysts aligned to certain players. I believe so. Do you care about the asterisk shit, honestly? Do you care when you hear people say it? No, I, I, not as much as I care about the, the storytelling around the game don't dilute the storytelling around the game because of your personal opinions and emotions and let's just present the facts around the game because that's what's going to push the game forward if we and correct and the fact is in 2019 before kd had went down with that achilles he definitely was the best player in the league make no mistake about it as he was playing offense and defense and the reason why i say that is because lebron james on the defensive end remember that ticker that a lot of sports segments, especially on ESPN, used to do on LeBron walking on defense. He was stat padding like a motherfucker his last few years in Cleveland. Continue to tell a history the right way. If we revised history based on how you personally feel, now you're getting in the way of, of the story. And what makes you bigger than our story when you're not even playing? That's how I look at it. And so 
I don't, the asterisks don't bother me more so than the people that's just saying it for the simple fact that you're upset. Or Correct. And a lot of the mainstream media members are upset that Kevin Durant had blocked their guy LeBron James from capturing multiple championships when he had returned to Cleveland. Things were set up that way, especially after that game seven in 2016. Nobody wants to say it, but the Warriors were not going to beat the Cavs. That's why they flew out way out in Long Island at the edge of it to talk to Kevin Durant to get him to come to the Warriors. They understood that. That Cavs team was not an undermanned team as the narrative would like you to believe. When they had went up against a 73-win Warriors team in that 2016 finals, Las Vegas had the Cavs as the favorites. That team was fucking stacked. Why it went to game seven, that didn't make any fucking sense. You're, you're emotional. It's just like, I know what I did. Obviously, it's in the record books. It's black and white. It's stamped to me. Let's have a real high-level conversation about basketball sometimes. Don't just bucket Kevin as one of the best scorers in the face yeah, of oh, the yeah. earth. Yeah. And then the GOAT conversation. But you can then acknowledge, like, for that conversation, they're going to leave me out unless I do X, Y, and Z. But in this conversation where hoopers know and people that want to talk about basketball... Now for Kevin Durant, he is going to have to prove himself and win a championship on his own. Not all championships are created equal. Kobe Bryant winning that championship over the Boston Celtics in 2010, he solidified his legacy. LeBron James 2016 championship in Cleveland solidified his legacy. For Kevin Durant, him going out on his own, especially after Stephen Curry solidified his legacy with that championship in 2022. Durant now is going to have to follow suit because a narrative will always be they won one without you. You see, before the Warriors had not won a championship without KD, at least Durant had that to fall back on. They can't say I'm not a champion because the Warriors have never done nothing without me. Even though they did win a championship in 2015, but a lot of us understand the context behind that. The Cavs were pretty much injury riddled and there was not as much respect put on that 2015 championship. Like I said, not all championships are created equal. So now, after Stephen Curry's 2022 championship, the pressure is now on KD. It's a sport, I'll be in any conversation. Yeah. You're comfortable with that. I, yeah, and I don't mind jumping in that, in that conversation of people who say I need to prove something to them to do X, Y, and Z, because I, I know my history, I know what I've done, so I can have those conversations too. And then I could just talk basketball with people who don't look at stuff like that. All I knew was storytelling around the NBA as a kid. I wasn't watching every game. I didn't have the NBA package. I couldn't, you know what I'm saying? It's, I, it was one TV in the house and there's five or six of us. I couldn't turn on what I wanted to turn on as the youngest. And so when they listen and hear about what's going on with the game, it ha I feel like it has, in order for that kid to truly get the best experience of what it's like, the truth has to be told. And, and, and what I'm saying is bigger than just me. It's just the overall fact of what's going on in the NBA and, and, and the storytelling around the NBA. It should be. Yeah, the storytelling is very fucked up. Once again, it's similar to the political landscape in which now sports reporting, you have to take sides, which is something that has never existed before. But as far as Kevin Durant, if you tell the story, he's going to have to win a championship on his own because Steph definitely applied that pressure after his beautiful, masterful, performance in the 2022 NBA Finals. He's another one that had to solidify himself by getting a championship on his own. He beat that Boston Celtics team with Andrew Wiggins as his second best player. Magnificent performance by Curry. Based on facts more so than whoever's writing this personal bias opinion. Yeah. Well, sadly, there, there, there's space for both most networks you know, lean towards one version of it. And and pound for pound, the people that are talking about it really do know the game. A lot of them they know do. the game. But, you know, we know what sells. And I think what's unfortunate is that, like, let's look at your body of work. That's not yeah, what sells, going back to the media talk, what sells for a lot of media members is that they're all following that Trump formula. I'm going to pick a side, you pick a side, and we got to debate. That Trump formula has trickled down into sports even look at the accolades that are accumulated just look at the seasons of the numbers oh, we're gonna get to that you know what i'm saying and how long are those seasons and those numbers how consistent those numbers are that to me is a career and 
no matter how many accolades you accumulate. Like, I have high level respect for Stefan Marbury, and he has no accolades or no real stake in any of these conversations. But you look at it, you look at the nine or ten seasons that he played. You know what I'm saying? Well, but that's the thing. So then when you talk about the GOAT conversation, right? Come on, KD. <laughs> Come on, KD. Stefan Murray don't have the same type of talent level as you. The expectations are completely different. If you want to see at the GOAT table, there's certain requirements. And I understand some of it is definitely nuanced. But there are tables sectioned off just outside of that GOAT table in which you see players like John Stockton are sitting at. Allen Iverson is sitting at. Chris Paul is going to be sitting at one of those tables. They are different tables. Make no mistake about it. But that GOAT table, it's only a selective few. And there's certain requirements in order to sit at that table. And speaking of someone that's sitting on one of the sides table, you could throw in Charles Barkley in there. There's actually more people sitting just outside the GOAT table than there's actually room for more people to come and join that GOAT table. There's so many players sitting just outside of that. That's how much rarefied air is in that section. And no matter how many accolades you accumulate, like I have high level respect for Stefan Marbury. And he has no accolades or no real stake in any of these conversations. But you look at it, you look at the nine or ten seasons that he played. You know what I'm saying? Well, but that's the thing. So then when you talk about the GOAT conversation, right? And I'm not here advocating for you to be in it or not be in it. I'm saying that. And me it, either. Right. No, I know you're not. I'm at just all. I'm just questioning just the whole conversation itself. I hear you because what because what I was saying is if you do two championships, two finals MVPs, an MVP, four scoring titles, three Olympic gold medals, all time Olympic score, then you talk about 17 years in the league, 16 years playing because you missed an entire year for what? The craziest injury ever which is never spoken about. I can say this. Yeah. You know, all those accolades Rich Kleiman just listed, it sounds like a bona fide Hall of Famer. But once again, that GOAT conversation, it's rarefied air, man. It's fucking rare. It's like the 0.00001% of the one percenters are in that conversation. But it's definitely nuanced. And also another year of your season where you miss 50 games 60 games with an injury that people didn't well, I should realize. have probably missed the whole season really you, you you played like 12 games or 18 games 27 but if i would have did the, the last surgery we did we right. did that first then i would have missed the whole year people don't realize that your jones fracture surgery was three surgeries for one injury your foot is so fucking different that oh man and they and they were and that, and they were saying that's a career threatening injury yeah because of the blood flow that goes to the bone and it might not all the way like it was a bunch of you know how that shit is that was scary and that's another underrated nuance about the Kevin Durant story the season ending injuries i mean it's happened to him in Golden State and Oklahoma City but yet his scoring numbers are going to be up there by the time he retires so imagine he had those other two years worth of stats. Matter of fact, he might have missed three seasons. You guys correct me in the comment section if I'm off about that. I believe he missed extra time when he first joined the Brooklyn Nets in order to come back. All of this shit was scary. Even when the Achilles, and it was like, man, you may get blood clots if you don't control oh, certain. You were bugging from the like, blood clots. I was clots. bugging him on all of that because I felt like it was affecting my whole body, just you know, my Achilles, um, because such a major ligament you know what i'm saying so this guy almost risked his fucking career for the golden state warriors because they knew he was leaving they nailed kevin durant on that fucking cross that's why they gave him a signing trade when he went to brooklyn so he can hit that guaranteed supermax but they nailed that boy right to the cross i don't know why kevin durant put himself in that circumstance because it was obvious his achilles was already fucked up right before they hit that western conference final then that's what goes that's what goes uh unnoticed when you talk about uh, professional athletes and how we deal with injuries. You know what I'm saying? And what it takes to really come out of that. And you was in it with me every day. Bro. Went to all three surgeries with you, obviously, but the third one, I had back surgery three days before. Oh yeah. I 
remember that. And you took a, a you were on a flight, not even first class. Nah, no, first seat class, then, bro. Seat this then was middle back. seat, last yeah. row of the plane joint. And, like you, this. and you had, what was it? Uh, this, this I surgery? I had the micro discectomy or some shit, yep. Then I remember you get to the Bay and you remember the first year in the Bay, you got hurt in DC. We go to get an MRI or an X-ray. They look at it and they say that you probably out for the year. And oh my gosh! They you remember told what us, happened? They told us that we that I was out for the year, and we were, and there's then a 30, 45 minute wait period before they called us back. So imagine that thirty to forty five minutes, we were in Bro, tears. Yes, because you had just left. It. That's the beautiful side about this uh, landscape that we're in right now, where you hear directly from the players, and to see Kevin Durant bounce back from both of those surgeries, especially the way he performed in Brooklyn, just having his toe in the line, he could have led that team to the finals and perhaps won the championship. It goes to show you how good of a player he is. Much respect to KD. From Oklahoma City to the Bay, you were bumping, and if you got hurt and they kept playing and winning, like, there was so much stress on you, there was so much bullshit that, like, what, you're out for the year? Yeah, it was just... And it was devastating. It was it was it was totally devastating to the point where it's just flat out tears as soon as they said that. Because it's just like, come on, it can't play out this way. No. Um, but then when we got the call, <laughs> yeah, let's tell you how bad DC traffic is. We we still in a car forty five minutes later on the way to the hotel and they called us and told us that um there's a six week injury, four or six week injury. And just some bone bruise and uh, and I was so relieved, and we almost celebrated. And I remember <laughs> that next morning, Zaza was so because Zaza the one that fell into my leg. He was so distraught. Like I felt so bad for him. He, it's like six or seven in the morning. He knocked on my door now, and he's just so apologizing so much. I felt so bad, but he didn't realize that. Like yo, you didn't you didn't get that news we got. No, he's straight up. And then get the other news we got. So I was like, I was excited at that time. So I was like, Zob, man, it's all good. We're good. We'll right I'll see you back. in the playoffs. I see you. I see, hold it down for me. And and, and that eased his mind, too. And, and I love Zaza. That's one of my favorite teammates ever. And I love that he came and did that. But um, that just shows the the emotion roller coaster at this this league and being an NBA player. And all that stuff matters, bro. And not just me. People around me feel that too. Oh my God. So you're Achilles, right? Let's just paint a picture for one second. You guys have won two championships in a row. You know, you're playing the Toronto Raptors. You're missing the first few games. There's a lot of buzz of whether you're gonna come back. And you call me, I'm in New York. It's right before game five. Mm -hmm. And you said to me, yo, get Mary Beth. We need the massage therapist to meet me in Toronto. I said, oh, I was up. You're like, I'm gonna play. And bro, it was like, more heroic than I think people even realize, to be to be fair. And I fly to Toronto, and no one knew you were playing, so I ended up being the only person there. It was like bad weather, and I come into town, and we're having that, like, I felt like Don King and Mike Tyson. I remember I was talking to you. I was like, bro, this is about to be that motherfucking moment. You're taking this series back. This is it. Then you was like, come on the team bus with me, bro. I'm like, hell yeah. I wore sweats because I was like, I got to be in the moment. Yeah. So I wore warrior sweats. I got on the bus. I remember Dre... Now, right here, I think Kleiman is putting a little sauce on it because Kevin Durant was at the end of his contract, about to be an unrestricted free agent. And it was clearly obvious there was something wrong with his Achilles. And for the Golden State Warriors, they were pressuring him to return. And it was almost looking like that was going to be the first time the NBA audience was going to see a franchise pretty much nail a player to the cross to try to win a championship. Kevin Durant is lucky his career didn't end that night. Dap me up. And I was, this was a bucket list moment for me. And then the fucking arena buzzing, Drake there. And what happened after that was honestly like a movie, a fucking movie. We're in the back with four doctors, Bob, the team's not even back and no one can talk. And it's, and it's obvious you tore your Achilles. Do you remember that moment still? Like it was yesterday, do you block that shit out? No, I remember it. I remember it's a huge moment in my life, man. It's just a life-changing moment. As I was walking back, I knew- Man, most people thought his career was done. 
it was obvious something was already wrong with him. To throw him out there was crazy. I know Rich Kleiman told him, fuck the Warriors. We're already leaving. Forget it. But the pressure was really on. And we've seen in real time how aggressive the Warriors really are. Remember, this past trade deadline, they hit up the LA Lakers to test the temperature on what they could do to get LeBron on their team. So the Warriors do have an understanding that them getting to the NBA Finals is not really guaranteed. As we've seen, it took years later in order for them to return to their exact final spot. For a fact that it was it was done. Because when I was walking, it wasn't, I didn't feel like a, I had a normal foot. Like, it felt like my foot was hanging, but I was just walking on my heel. And I couldn't feel anything else but my heel. So I'm like, this is no way I can even walk straight or try to walk straight right now. So I know it's just not like no strain or nothing. And I felt, a, and I heard a pop. It's 20,000 people in there. It's the finals. And I heard a pop. So I'm like, oh my gosh. And uh, my whole basketball career just flashed before my eyes. Everything. Every yep. Because he was warned. KD was warned. <laughs> Why would his whole basketball career flash before his eyes? Because he was already fucking warned. That if he makes that move and play in that game in Toronto, that that could be the end of his career. Everything I did, everything that I thought about, all my favorite moments, all my bad moments, it flashed. And that's why if you watch, I'm just sitting there gazing into the crowd before somebody came over and helped me up. Because I'm just like, this shit is over with. Like, I truly don't know what I'm about to be. And that's a, that's a nerve wracking feeling when you don't know who you are. That was facts facts and that's why rich crime and that's why i said rich climbing put an extra sauce on it <laughs> the fact that kd's going out there to sacrifice himself when literally after these finals he will be an unrestricted free agent so he could have had possibly a career ending injury followed by having no guaranteed contract behind it so just in that one night kevin durant could have went from being a basketball player to now having to search for a new identity because his NBA life is basically over. Scary shit. You know what I'm saying? And as I was walking back, you know, I seen everybody, and you know, Kyle Lowry was trying to settle the crowd down. I seen Drake up there, over there upset. Drake's my, I love that dude so much, bro. Like, he, he, you knew and he knew. And everybody knew KD. Come on, everybody knew. Him tearing his Achilles right there didn't shock anybody. We already knew what it was. That's why the Warriors gave you that sign and trade when you decided to go to Brooklyn in free agency. They didn't have to do that, but they did it as a gesture to signal to other potential free agents that we're not going to do KD like that. But that shit looked bad on that franchise. That they were willing to do that knowing that KD was going to bounce from that franchise regardless. Because I tell him everything. And, and, and I seen how I seen how mad he was about it. And then as I went back to the locker room, they give you this test where I guess they squeeze on your calf to see if your foot will move. And my foot will move. And that's when every, and every do doctor knows that. And I remember a doctor did that and he was just looking around and just didn't say nothing. No one wanted to say shit. He just couldn't say nothing. And I was just like, this is it and see a regular achilles tear is bad but the fact that everyone knew that if he hit the court that shit was gonna tear that's even worse that is even worse once again kd going down like that was a bad look on the warriors just not even them losing the finals just the way they was willing to sacrifice kd shows you how aggressive the warriors really are when it comes to winning that's when i knew i was like all right i probably will never i probably won't go back to the bay again and this whole thing is just, this is the end of this whole thing. Yeah, it was just like, this is the end of this whole thing. Like, I didn't even, I had left to come on that road trip, and I didn't even go back to the Bay after that to get my clothes or nothing. Y'all all did that for me. Went straight to New York, got surgery, and was in New York and since then. And it was such a, man, it was such a defining moment in my career, bro. People don't realize the thoughts that I had as I was going through all of that shit. Cause you, it affects your human life at that point. You can't walk, you can't function like a regular human. 
You got to learn how to walk again on top of you trying to learn how to be an athlete again. You know what I'm saying? And it was just, man, it was tough. Just because. Once again, for him to come back and play on that level that he did, going up against Giannis and just having his toe on the line, man, that's how good and dedicated of a basketball player that he is. And know what the recovery is like. You just hear about it. You know, and it's different when you go through it. So I, all I knew was just like, this is the toughest injury ever. It's gonna be hard to come back from. It's a seven, eight, it's a year process. Every day is tedious. That's all I kept hearing. So I'm just, and I knew I liked, and I knew I can grind out of rehab, but I'm just like, would I even help? You know what I'm saying? I know I get. Damn, KD's coming to tears just thinking about it. Jesus. Like, but will I really be the one that I was before? And that was 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 stressing me out because I didn't, I couldn't know until I start. And then I, my my mind started to get at ease when I started playing pickup. When I started going against other players that were in the NBA, and I'm like, mm, I can still drive past him. I can still shoot over this guy. There's certain stuff that I was missing out my game that I had to build back up again. Like my range from deep, like stopping on a dime, pulling up from deep. Like my fadeaway is going right off my leg, pushing off this right leg. I feel like I had to build that stuff up and it was stressful, but I was like, I could still like, I still feel solid around the younger players in the league. So that's when I started test myself out, that's when I got better. And that's when my mind became more at ease. And then I started to realize like, oh, I can do this again. And then it happened over time. Like my first preseason game, I was like, okay. My first six, seven games in the league, I was playing all right. I was like, all right. Then my first playoff series, this is the highest intensity of basketball, playing against the Milwaukee Bucks, a champion. I'm like, all right, this is the highest level of ball and I can play 48 minutes straight, all right, I'm back. That's when I finally realized like, all right, I'm all right. When you think about that series, KD playing all those minutes, had they gotten past the Bucks, man, his energy level, <laughs> I don't know if they could have lasted in the finals, but they probably would have won it against CP3 with him just having those meltdowns in crucial moments, but KD was burnt out. I'm surprised he lasted as long as he did in that series against Milwaukee with Kyrie out and James Harden having that hamstring issue. But it shows you the level of talent and dedication he really has coming off that surgery and just performing like that. A lot of guys would not have come back or it would have taken them two or three seasons to get back playing like that. I think it's crazy that two of the most defining moments in your career and your career is not nearly done and you've accomplished so much is this Achilles injuries on on the biggest stage ever. Yeah. And having one of the most epic iconic games in New York City that came up a, a quarter of an inch short. Right. And I'm not one of the people that's like, man, the media don't treat you right. Like, I get it. We get the asterisks. We get it all. Yeah. We get it all. But what I'm talking about is that like a lot of that asterisk, once again, it comes from a lot of media members understanding that KD had blocked LeBron James from perhaps getting his six rings. The legacies of KD, Curry and LeBron are all interlinked. Stephen Curry allowing KD to come to the Golden State Warriors and helping him get over on LeBron. LeBron himself beating KD to get his first NBA championship and on his pursuit to get multiple rings to perhaps catch up to Jordan and be on that GOAT conversation after the 2016 finals, KD had made that decision to join Golden State. And at the same time on Kevin Durant's end, Stephen Curry being a bigger star than him while he was at Golden State and just him never receiving the love and adoration that Curry did and also the respect of getting those two rings. Followed by the 2022 championship by Curry, has added even more pressure on KD to prove himself, even though he's a two-time NBA champion as well as a two-time MVP. So once again, all their stories are intertwined. You really can't explain one of their legacies without the other. Can we spend a little time on the fact that you are 10th all-time in scoring and you missed two full seasons? You're fourth all-time or third all-time in scoring average. You've played 16 years in the NBA like you said, one of those seasons, you only played 27 games and every year you're averaging 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 32, shooting over 50%. That conversation, whether you want to put it in the go, you want to put it in the best hooper ever, that conversation is important. It's important for me. That conversation he's describing right there is a first ballot Hall of Famer, but the GOAT conversation is completely different. 
there's certain criteria that never ever change need to have out there and it's one of the things i wanted to get across in this interview because when i was hearing you talk about it the other day everyone went right to your decision like cool take the decision yeah but also see this see other. just see this yeah do you feel like you have to accomplish more do you are you are you at all motivated by this by the story the narrative the only thing KD's missing is winning one without curry just win one on your own because had curry had not won that championship in 2022 the narrative would still be uh, they couldn't really win one without KD. At least he had that to fall back on. Now he does not have that. So the only scenario now is to solidify yourself by getting one on your own without the Golden State Warriors. I wouldn't say I'm motivated by the narrative. Like, I hear it and I understand it. But I've never been motivated by that. You know who was motivated by the narrative? Curry was. Once Durant left, we seen Curry bulked up. He got stronger. He actually was leading his team while guys were going through injuries in, in the 2021 season, even though it didn't lead to any playoff success or any finals appearance. But Curry led his team throughout that whole season, remaining healthy, looking stronger. And he built himself up to carry that team the following season all the way to the finals to win the championship. And finally getting his own NBA Finals MVP. You know that shit mattered to Curry. It's always been about, can I perfect the craft tonight? Can I be at my best tonight? And that's always the challenge more so than anything. And once I started to understand that, like, this was my goal all, around, all along, was to build my craft to the best that I can get it and, and fitting that into a team instead of, like, I just want to win championships and be have these accolades for myself. That's when the game started to become more fun to me. And that's what I lean on more than anything. So once the game... Come on, KD. Really, man? If that was the case, you would have stayed in OKC. Come on, man. Let's not cap. Is once I don't enjoy that part of it, then that's probably when I think about when it's time for me. But I'm so... I, I enjoy so much of, like, even the cause. I'm like, man, fuck. This is... I hated this fucking game tonight. This is a shitty game by us. I enjoy knowing that all right, I can go back the next game and 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 avenge our loss. You know what I'm saying? I, I enjoy that part of the grind. So, you know, it's just for me like the narratives are. I hear them and I listen to them and it inspires me and fuels me. But it's not the reason I play. You know what I'm saying? It's just it's just part of it's just something I can't avoid. And I would say there's been times where the people closest to you are like, bro, shoot more. Like, yeah. I, I think if anything, you know, I see the scoring in the league right now and it's insane, right? And I, I mean, the talent level's off the charts, but I feel like there's games you could have went for 50 or 60 and you've just chosen to commit to playing the way you like to play game in and game out, no matter what. Yep, especially in Golden State. There were times where KD already had 30 points, shooting well over 55%. And they just sat him down. They were blowing teams out. KD is a perfect glove. You could really fit him on any team. Just the ultimate weapon. He plays in any system. He doesn't have to have the ball nonstop. He could catch his shoe. He could score in all kinds of ways. Yeah. Yeah, it's times where I would have had a high number of points in the first quarter. And they could easily turn it to a big night. But... I was trying to do what it takes to win the basketball game. And if it takes for me to go have to score big and shoot a lot of shots, then I'll have to do it. But sometimes when I had those high scoring games, now um, by the time I get back into the game, now we got to play more of a team game and I might not be able to get those big numbers. And I had to be cool with that early on, knowing that, all right, I play with great players that can do the same things too. So sometimes it may not be all about me. See right there, KD's talking about being the ultimate glove right there. That's why he is the perfect superstar. The perfect fucking superstar. You could fit him on any team. And that's the beauty of playing on great teams and going to the Warriors and playing for the Nets and playing for the Suns. And you play around great players and different perspectives around the game. You understand it's bigger than you. Damn, was that a shot at Westbrook? He didn't mention OKC. <laughs> he didn't mention OKC. We know Westbrook loves to play that your turn, my turn shit. And I learned that over time. And I think that's a part of the growth of being more than just a score. Why do you think people in the media think you're not a good leader or that you're not a leader? 
I just I'm not as charismatic as my peers. I don't have a personality that's like fit for TV like my peers and a lot of those stories of what we talk about don't get spoken about in the media and that's just really what it is it's like you gotta sell what you're doing as well facts you really do the way the nba is set up today you really gotta sell it you see anthony edwards he looks like a leader on television but then when you see some of the comments he made about the all-star game just not understanding that he's one of the figureheads and you can't downplay that all-star weekend while at the same time your league is trying to pitch it to streaming companies to buy it or to buy certain segments and try to get a bag out of it. So even though he's selling it, you see him making media members laugh, very charismatic, he seems like a leader, but certain actions show you, you know, he's not really thinking with 2020 hindsight. And it's a failed thing across multiple industries and sectors of society, understanding leadership. They kind of approach it on a one size fits all spectrum. But this past era with LeBron James and KD and Stephen Curry, they're showing you that there's different types of leaders. Stephen Curry, no doubt, is a leader. The fact that he let KD come to the team and he was willing to play second fiddle, even though the person who seemed to be most uncomfortable in their role ended up being KD. But Durant does show leadership in his actions as far as his dedication to the game. But as far as him being stoic, especially with the Twitter fingers, and also mainly he should have ignored the noise about him being in Golden State. Because in reality, the Warriors were the perfect place for Durant to actually exist. So there are certain stoic qualities that he is missing. And it doesn't mean that he's not a leader. Once again, leadership is always kind of approach on a one size fits all spectrum. But Kevin Durant throughout his career has shown that he's missing a bit of the stoicism. The following Kyrie to Brooklyn, making your announcement even though you're the top free agent he made his announcement after Kyrie and even on his exit kind of played out the same way Kyrie asked out and then he asked out even though he just signed a brand new four-year extension so there's a lot of holes in his jacket that takes away from him being stoic I haven't sold it enough you know and I feel like I don't I mean I don't I don't feel like I need to I don't feel like I want people to call me a leader but I also don't want people to say I'm not one either you know what I'm saying? Because eh, they don't see. Man, KD, fuck what people think, man. Just do you. God damn. <laughs> this is the problem with social media. It actually exposed what bothered KD. And that's always been his biggest mistake. You're showing your fucking cards. So people are just going to continuously troll you. Because that's what mainly social media is. There's a lot of trolling. We're in the troll era. That's one of the reasons why the media tends to not like Kawhi Leonard, because he's not on social media. He's not exposing what he likes or don't like. They can't really get to his head. They can't bother him. They don't know how he feels. If KD had more of that aura, along with his dedication to the game, they will look at him kind of more as a leader. You got to sell what you're doing as well. And I haven't sold it enough, you know, and I feel like I don't I mean, I don't I don't feel like I need to. I don't feel like I want people to call me a leader but i also don't want people to say i'm not one either you know what i'm saying because they, they don't see what goes on behind the scenes or what i talk about or my intentions or the relationships that i built with all oh, my my teammates and support staff but when guys like that say that i just got to chalk it up to them just not being aware of what goes on instead of like wanting to you know push a narrative for myself maybe not a narrative or tell the truth for myself I, I, I you know or, or expose the truth or how great of a leader I am I don't feel like it's necessary I just chalk it up to those guys not being aware of who I am yeah and it's okay to be okay with that and that's where KD has to find comfortability in that just as he's comfortable enough to reflect on his career with Rich Kleiman right here but again we're in an era now where it's great to see players have a nice medium where they could truly be themselves and kind of give the NBA audience a bit more insight. Because when we reflect on KD's career, he is one of those top tier players of all time. But like any other player, he's a product of his era. So it is what it is. We'll see if he could bring a championship to Phoenix and leave no doubts in the mind of the very same people who put an asterisk next to his name. But hey, that's all we have for today. You fellas definitely hit up the mailbag with any questions. And until next time, peace.